JD in the Duffel Bag podcast, yeah, it's part two with my guy, Eddie Hearn, and I can't believe, I can't believe what's going on. Like, you know, when I saw that you was doing this, yeah, I thought, nah, this, this, nah, nah. And I've come here, because I, I watched some of uh, the fights on Saturday, but I, I've actually come here and looked at it and I'm like, what's going on? That's exactly what we wanted the fighters to feel like, because this is a dangerous sport. And I just felt, I almost felt that it was disrespectful to take him into a studio, like in the middle of nowhere, a dingy dark studio, yeah. and let a fighter who's fighting for his career, and let's be honest, like yeah. sometimes his life in there. Yeah, for real. So we got to give you the platform and the opportunity in the stage to actually allow you to try and achieve your dreams or peak at the right time or try and move on to a world title or in some cases this Friday win a world title yeah 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 so when I first come up with the idea and it was like oh Eddie Hearn's garden and even like fighters that we don't represent Tyson yeah. Fury was like digging out Dylan White going oh you're yeah stick to Eddie's garden do you know what I mean <laughs> I wanted to produce something that people would just be shocked by and firstly watching on Saturday with the pyrotechnics and the fireworks and the staging and the house and the lighting everyone was like globally yeah this is unreal but also when you get here like you have today yeah you get that feeling of this is major and we have to let people know that boxing's major 100% but listen before we even because there's going to be like a lot of people who are that watching this year that are like super casual mm. boxing fans and stuff and may not particularly know it, like what like why this is a big deal yeah so like let me just like let's set the scene right now i'm in eddie hearn's what is this old house yeah old house now office he headquarters headquarters yeah. so there's a, it's an office yeah? yeah yeah right so you know we're in covid times which means that you know a lot of people are working from home can't work wh whatever we, we're easing out of lockdown just a tiny bit but with that the live industry to a, a big degree was kind of put on hold so people were trying to find ways to adapt and your way of adapting was to put a boxing ring in the garden <laughs> <laughs> and, and now we what's it called um matchroom square garden exactly i yeah, love the yeah, sound yeah, of that yeah, yeah, yeah. i love the sound yeah. of that yeah it's, look i think that across all live events we're a, a live events company so it's been disastrous for us really because our bread and butter is staging event after event after event doesn't matter if it's boxing golf snooker darts table tennis fishing whatever it is that's what we do week in week out like yeah. every day of the year and when you're flying in business like we were and then all of a sudden someone comes and says you can't put live events on anymore obviously that's the time where you've got to think on your feet you've got to try and think outside the box did you and was you thinking outside the, the box straight away like was you oh, straight you away, was, straight you, away oh. I was thinking it's only going to be a month two months do you know what I mean just relax spend a bit of time with your family reschedule and then once this is silly things out of the way yeah. we'll just go back to these new dates then once we started to realise how serious it was we started to realise that behind closed door events will be okay yeah and the broadcaster will always need content the fans will always want to watch live sport but number one the revenue is not going to be at the same level because we can't drive people through the turnstiles yeah and B, all of a sudden now we have to produce something that is different to mm. the viewer. You know, we've, spilt, we've spent the last 10 years trying to build the crowds and the energy and dressing up and dancing, sweet Caroline, few pints, like feel good, to yeah. all of a sudden, nothing. So our selling point and production values when we broadcast events is the crowd the energy that perception yeah. of this is major you know if AJ's boxing at Wembley it's 90,000 oh my god you know pyrotechnics lighting firework boxing massive yeah then all of a sudden you're faced with running sports behind closed doors with no atmosphere yeah with no energy with no perception that it's a major event so how yeah. do you how do you overcome that and that is to produce something out of the box that mm. gets everyone's interest and fight camp is a project 
that people are talking about now. Even the first one uh, with Eggington, like unbelievable night yeah, of I boxing. Wanna, I but these guys, they're not superstars. Mm. Yeah. When we get to the last week, you've got your Dillian White, you've got your Alexander Povetkin, you've got your Katie Taylor. Mm. So that's a monster. But in the meantime, it's not even that people are talking just about the fights. People are saying fight camp. Yeah. Fight camp. It's, a, it's, actual, fight it's camp. an actual thing. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, Eddie, you know, I'll get stopped. You're doing it in your garden, seriously. Like, yeah. <laughs> you, people have got to buy into the concept. They've got to, you've got to let them use their imagination to try and picture it. Like you're, you know, if people are listening to this without video, yeah, you're you're telling the story about where you are now, what you're seeing. Mm. All of a sudden, people start getting their head around that. They see the drone shots and they're just thinking, "This is wild." I've got to tune in and watch this. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, honestly, I didn't like when I heard you first talking about it. I just thought, oh yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but it is, that's just like, obviously I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah. No, but like, you know, everyone thought oh, I was a publicity stunt, you know, and listen, of course it was, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was a publicity stunt with yeah. a plan. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But okay, let me ask you this, yeah, like, I want you to talk to me specifically about, like, the day that, like, someone came up with this idea, like, what... Like, tell me about that. Where was you and what was said that made this happen? Because I can imagine that you're possibly in a room with staff or whoever, or even just on the phone, just having a conversation about, you know, doing indoor events or whatnot. And someone might say, do it in your back garden. Yeah. Why you? So what happened was about a week before lockdown started and if things were getting quite bad, we were filming a fitness show for Sky called Fighting Fit. And we were supposed to be doing it in a studio down the road. And all of a sudden, some of the talent, like we had fighters, we had celebrities, we had musicians, everything, yeah. started pulling out, right? They were getting paid a fee to come and do a fitness session and we'd film it and you know, we'd do different episodes for Sky. And everyone was like, oh, I'm not really comfortable, you know, I don't really want to be in a studio right now with the virus. And, and I thought, you know what, what we'll do is, we'll do it outdoors. Mm. So I brought it here. And we did the fitness series, 24 shows for Sky, Fighting Fit, on the lawn here. Right, okay. we had the crew, and it's beautiful, backdrop. And I started thinking to myself, we could even do fights here, you know? And for, for a long time, and I've li I lived here at the age of five, right? Yeah. Five till 25. So, for a long time, I always thought about, you could actually stage something out here. I used to, I used to get, in the summer, DJs and stuff like that, and I'd put them on the top of that, the stairs. Oh yeah, and, and have them mixing up there. In here. Yeah, it was yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. That's right? six. Still. Yeah. So when we started looking at media days and stuff like that, we used to have a ring in the middle, get some fighters in to move around. After fighting fit, and we realised that our choice was basically going to a studio, or go into an empty arena, or think outside the box. There's a little bit of an argument between me and Frank Smith, who works for me, about he says that he also said about doing a show outdoors okay, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But the fight camp concept, there's a there's a there's a documentary that will be dropped, and there's a voice note from me where I come up with all these ideas, Chucky, right? Like, and they think I'm mad. In fact, it's really good for staying humble because mm. my team of people actually think that I'm a bit of a blagger and a chancer, and actually they're they're 100 right. You need one of those, though. Yeah, yeah. You, I think you but need I know one. I of said those. to my mum the other day. It's quite funny. Just just coming to my mind. She always she never lets me sort of dine out on my success, right? Mm. So she'll always say to me, "Well, you're only a spoiled little rich kid anyway." <laughs> like she goes, "You're only here because your dad." Like even doesn't matter what I, I achieve yeah. yeah she will still go well you had a big head start in life you know yeah she's yeah. right but i'd like to think that i've kind of got to the level now we have to go do you know so i was sitting there on sunday i went to a mum you know what I said and we were talking about the night that had just passed at fight camp yeah and they were like it was unbelievable you know blah 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 and i said mum at what point are you going to turn around to me and go maybe you're quite good do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, we know that I got an old man with a few quid. We know I had a little bit of a leg up and a head start. Yeah. We know that I'm a bit of a blagger and all mouth. But at what point do you actually look at the consistency over the years and go, maybe it's not luck. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Maybe yeah. it's not blag. But I couldn't do it without the team of people that are around us. But I come up with these concepts and they go, I, I can imagine sending that voice note. And the voice note was, um, you know, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to stage four consecutive weeks outside. We're going to call it Fight Camp. 
Yeah. You know, we're going to have the hotel down the road. We're going to build content there all week, blah, blah, blah. I know they all got it and went, oh, God, he's at it again. Do you know what I mean? But they ran with it. And, you know, I can't... I come up with the ideas. I sell. That's what I do. Yeah. I'm a salesman. These guys, the operational guys, you don't realise the work that goes in. Mm. You know, the meetings with the environmental health, the health and safety, you know, the rig, the mm. TV companies... You know the testing companies now. Yeah. You know, the British Boxing Board of Control. It's like you have to overcome. Sometimes when there's when you have a problem, people's biggest mistake is they think it's just one big problem. It's not. It's loads of little small problems. Yeah, that, that you have to individually overcome. Yeah, yeah, of course. And all of a sudden you get to a point where you go, do you know what? We can do this. We're on the verge of doing this. And and there might have been a hundred problems in that problem. Yeah. You know, and even the last maybe the last one or two problems were on Wednesday or Thursday of last week. So yeah, you never yeah. stop trying to overcome them but, but those like problems that you get like that usually i mean in this in this situation here it might feel as though okay yeah you you know you've got these problems leading up to it and it's oh, that's typical but technically you have problems even when you've got a normal sure. night anyway it's just like that's yeah, but part you know of what the game is, Chucky? different kind of problems motivate you in different ways so yeah. some problems can drain you you know and this goes for life business in any industry like our problems might be on the week of a fire, yeah. a fighter turns around, you get a phone call, he's out injured. He can't make the weight. He's failed a drugs test. Yeah. And that's like, my That God. would give me anxiety. Yeah, but that's, but once you get into a position where you've experienced something time and time again, it's just like, you know, morbidly, someone passing away, yeah? Yeah. Like, once you go through that for the first time and you've grieved, yeah. you know, you're still always gonna grieve, but maybe sometimes your emotions can handle it a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's like the same with me. You know, for the first time when I might have got the phone call saying, so-and-so's, you've sold out 20,000 at the O2, and you get a phone call the week before and someone says, sorry, he's out injured. Yeah. Like, the first time that happens, you, you go to your knees and you cry. Do you know what I mean? The, and then the, the, the 20th time it happens, you go, I f***ing hate this sport. But, exactly. But isn't that, isn't that also down to like, because you can get used to that, mm. but then sometimes the stakes become higher and greater. Do you get what I'm saying? So like, isn't there a level of anxiety that you get when you deal with somebody like, for example, Anthony Joshua, mm -hmm. you know, there's a you know a big fight coming up and that, and there's this part in, within you that is like, I hope that such and such don't get in. I hope that this person don't pull out or whatever. Yeah. Of course you hope that, but yeah. like, isn't a, isn't there a greater level of anxiety when yeah. it comes to that? Yeah, there is, for sure. And that's a disaster. Like, you know, it's a disaster for any show to fall through. Yeah. Like, especially for an AJ show to fall through. And we had that last year. Yeah. With, uh, sorry, well, yeah, last year with Jarrell Miller. Yeah, you know, I'd built this fight in New York with Jarrell Miller and AJ, come into a press conference at Madison Square Garden, boom, like they just, he shoved him, we did a behind the scenes after gloves were off. It was wild. We sold out Madison Square Garden. I'm thinking, ah. Oh. And then I'm at home, just had dinner with my kids, and the phone goes, and I look at it, and it's Margaret Goodman from VADA, which is a drug testing global agency. You never want to get a phone call from Margaret Goodman. Okay, so as soon as you like, saw that come Eddie, up on I've your phone. i got some bad news. I'm like, oh, my. and I'm thinking, who is it? You know, it could be, could be 100 fires. It's Jarrell Miller. I'm like, like that and it's like like is it is it questionable like you know is it a mistake like, mm. no I'm really sorry it's not and yeah. we've got to speak to the commission I'm afraid the fight's off oh and at that point that's when you know my missus goes to me you're right and I go I just need five minutes yeah and yeah. I go into another room and I just lay on the bed and I just think right think what are you going to do now you know first thing is you call AJ let him know you call Rob McCracken you let him know then before you know it, this news is going to spread, right? Then you got to handle all the media, the media, and then all of a sudden, five literally, you know, in this sport, there's no secrets. No. There would have been loads of people that were happy that oh, all of, of a sudden we've, you know, we've got a problem. Yeah. So five <laughs> minutes later, literally five minutes later, on, on you know, on confidential information, yeah. right? Five minutes later, oh, oh, phones going off, Sky, BBC, all ESPN, all the outlets in America. So then deal with that. Then all of a sudden, who's he going to fight? Right? And now every contender in the top 15 has just said, well, I wanted two million to fight Anthony Joshua. Now I want, I want five now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So then it's like going through, it's a night absolute it's nightmare. Crazy. You know? But this project, yeah. the problems were different. Learning about the virus, how it works, how it operates, you know, 
where we people have got to sit, PPE, masks. It's really sort of menial stuff, but also it's a different kind of problem. So I found this quite refreshing yeah. because the problems we face day in, day out, they still exist. We might get a phone call today to say Sanzo's failed a test and yeah. they're injured or they don't That's normal. Well. That's yeah, normal. but I can handle that. Yeah. The other stuff I found quite compelling to try and overcome. And also, the, the I call them the rivals or the other people in the industry mm-hmm. going, oh, in his garden, oh, well, oh, what's he going to do? Some fireworks. Oh, we're not about the fireworks. We're about the fights, you know. And then they watch on Saturday probably just throwing up in their dinner. I was you know just, I mean? listen, I've got that on my yeah. notes. I was about to say, yeah, you, like, big and serious, your competitors at times must just want to vomit in their right. mouth. Our competitors, I don't even call them competitors because Tesco don't worry about the small shop on the high street, <laughs> right? So... But they are writing to the British Boxing Board of Control, yeah. complaining about things that we are doing. Four or five pages long. They've got a show the next day. Ain't that, you know snitch- I mean? ain't that snitching? Yeah, it is. No, they're grasses, mate. They're proper is grasses. Yeah, yeah, snitching got, on yeah, you, yeah, Eddie. I know, I know, I know. That's but, crazy. But it's got to that point now where they, they can't win. Yeah. So they've got to try something outside the box, right? Yeah. But what it does is it spurs me on. you know. And actually, it's bad news for them because... If they didn't, if they rolled over and just just let me just run them all over, maybe I'd get a little bit arrogant. Maybe I'd get a little bit, um, you know, just lazy. Yeah. So now we did the event on Saturday. So the pyrotechnical company mm. and the fireworks company were doing the week one mm. and week four, right? Well, I'm sitting over there last week watching Ted Cheeseman yeah. come down the stairs and just this unbelievable pyrotechnic ex- I like, saw it yeah and I've gone to Frank Smith who works for me I went bring them back next week he's like Ed they're expensive I went I don't give a f- bring them back next yes. week because I know the images you know the value of that for the event for matchroom for boxing you know that, those images are so powerful where people you know you've got the drone taking pictures and go where is, what is that yeah yeah go, that's boxing mate Boxing's back, and look what they've done. It's powerful for history. When you, years put like down the line, 10, 20 years down the line, yeah, we'll look back at this moment, and there'll be pictures of that. Not just videos, but there'll be pictures of that. And that will, like, it, it, it documents something that happened at a time oh, where you look and you think, right, that was kind of special, you know? I've said recently, I think this is our biggest challenge and maybe will be our biggest achievement, honestly. Yeah. Like, from everything that we've done, now, whether it's Frotch Groves at Wembley when we started off, AJ Klitschko, AJ at Madison Square Garden, Saudi Arabia, whatever it is, this feels like, you know, kind of like our greatest moment because everyone will remember what happened in the pandemic. Like, this this is something that I think is going to go down, you know, like... They'll be teaching World this in War, school. Whatever, exactly. The plate, like, you know, yeah. across history. And everyone will be looking at how businesses and how sports bounce back. Listen, and by the way, some boxing businesses have come back before us, mm. but no one's going to take the pictures of their shows in a studio and go, oh, this is what they did. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So for us, it's, it's an opportunity to say, this is how we're different. And the value to our business of this advert globally, you know, we're going we're gonna to be doing money on yeah. this project, but the value to our business and our, the reputation to our business for people to say, wow, look at how Matrim do things. Yeah. That, you can't put a price on that. And and that is why we choose to do what we do because we could have saved half a million quid, a yeah. million quid, and gone in a studio. But where's the momentum? With mm. 10 years I've been grafting away in boxing to try and get us to where we want to be. If I would have just come back in a studio in Brentwood, we would have just gone, yeah. and every other sport that's trying to innovate would have just gone past us. This way, no one's going past us because no one's done anything like this. Forget boxing. Mm. No one's done anything like this across sport. Did you nearly knock it on the head? Did you? Yeah, about three or four weeks ago. Three or four weeks ago, we had, again, the grasses, you know, coming in from... Oh, no. So we've got to do something about that. (laughs) About, like, noise and all this. So we have to go to the council. And in the end, it was like, should we just go to your call? Yeah. And I was like... Can you imagine now? I said I've gone out there. I've been blabbing my mouth for the last two months. We can't. We can't turn our backs on it now. We've got to stick with it. Hang in there. Mm-hmm. Keep solving those little problems. You know, and that's a great. It's the great mindset for any 
life problem or any business. Mm. Day by day, wake up in the morning, stay focused on what you have to do yeah. for that day. Because people get too, people overcomplicate life. Everyone talks about you have to have a medium and long-term goal, agree. But if you don't focus on a short-term goal, the others are completely irrelevant anyway. 100%. So it's all about waking up. And when you're struggling, when you're struggling to find direction or you're struggling to find some focus, the short-term strategy, i.e. that day, is so much simpler to say, okay, what have I got to achieve today? Could be anything. Could be, I've got to walk the dog. I've got to take my clothes to the dry cleaners. I've got to go to work. I've got to go to the gym. I've got These are all the things that I'm just telling you because I've got to do yeah. them, right? Yeah, That's yeah. my list today. Yeah. So if I lose focus or feel like you know I'm 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 on the wrong path, I will just write them down. Yeah, it could be could be like, you know, make your lunch at home today and take it to work. Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, I will tick everyone off, and there might be six, seven, ten, and I will go. That was a good day. Yeah. So luckily, we ticked all those boxes through the whole way. That when we got to a point where we were like, oh, can we reach our long-term goal? We could. Because we're taking care of, you know, we, from the very get go, we did things properly. I do want to say to anyone who is a, a casual boxing fan and only watches the big fights and whatnot, yeah, you got to watch that Sam Egerton oh, no, yeah, right. and Ted Cheeseman fight, yeah. Go and it's, I'm sure it's on YouTube or whatever, yeah. That was an absolute punch up. Yeah. Really, really good fight. And that must have been something that you must have been proud to have in your back garden. Yeah, when you, know you know when you, create a card of fights yeah. and we're, we're only allowed five fights a night here so you want everyone to be a good fight yeah? yeah you hope that it will deliver what you believe it can but the thing about fight camp is you're giving fighters who aren't haven't yet received superstar status in those first three weeks the opportunity to fight on a platform where like this is their opportunity and I said to Sam Eggington after the fight listen I know you lost and you're gutted, but trust me, people respect you. People want to watch you fight again. So don't, don't look at it like the end of your career. You know, you box You gain well, fans you... like that. You can lose, you can lose and gain fans and respect. Yeah, for sure. Like, you could double it. Yeah. You can literally double yeah. fans and respect by losing. And they put it on the line. But, but you know? performing. Audiences affects performances, don't it? For some yeah, people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and so like, the, the most interesting thing that I found from this and just not even just from boxing but just from sport and just like everything that is affected by having an audience here yeah, is seeing how that affects the person who's working mm. like do you do you underperform because you're so you like the audience you like being around yeah. people and I'm like that I'm, I'm a person who at times thrives off being around people and doing my stuff around people mm. and showcasing whatever it is I'm around people but there are a lot of people that again this would be perfect for them because it's like you know what there's no real pressure and it's yeah. just me and you yeah exactly it's yeah. just me and you boxing is interesting isn't it because I've asked that question a lot to the fighters and every fighter has said mate when you get in there and someone's trying to take your head off you switch on yeah. you know what I mean I think for footballers and for other sports and even Musicians, yeah, you know, like you're gonna if you're a even a DJ, but if you're a musician or a singer yeah. and you're up there, like imagine being a rock band or whatever, and you got eighty thousand people just screaming for you. Yeah, like, that's got to be the great. I mean, who didn't think about that as a kid? You know what I mean? But so that's 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 energy. The fight game's a bit different because you are quite literally fighting for your life in there. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So. And I think once those punches land, people tend to sort of forget where they are and focus on what they're doing. A lot of fighters have said, it's really nice to be able to get clear instructions from my corner without my mates or my yeah. family ringside going, come on, do this, jab, come on, move, yeah. jab, yeah. move, do it. You know? And you don't realise. Everyone, everyone turns into a, a super expert, boxing expert. Know, especially when, when they've had about six pints and yeah, it's their yeah, yeah, nephew yeah. or something yeah. like that, you know. So it's nice they said to go back in the corner say right this is what you're doing this the, the only thing that's a bit weird see that black box there yeah that's where the commentary is at the back here, okay yeah, right yeah yeah. So, just, yeah 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 and we haven't got a shield on it yet which we're going to put on this weekend so adam smith's in there going and he's hurt he's backed <laughs> up against the ropes and you can hear everything is you know it? what i mean 
So you see the fighter almost at times going, oh, yeah, I'm all no, right. No, I'm not. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm okay. all right, yeah. yeah so it's, it's, it's weird, but yeah. again, going back to the whole stage, I knew that if you didn't give them that stage, they might be a bit flat. Yeah. But they won't be flat here because you walk out and you go, blimey, wow. Yeah. And again, now last week, and all the publicity around fight camp, the fighters this week mm. are in the hotel now and they're like, oh, I can't believe I'm on fight camp. Yeah. You know, and it's just What's it's just thing? about making them get ready for a big performance. For if it looks as though that we ain't going to be anywhere near having, you know, audiences and stuff like that, yeah. Andy Joshua could be in the garden swinging be, it out. Yeah, yeah, and he would do as well because you, you can't sit and wait. Like in any career, inactivity is going to hurt you. Yeah. Right? In any business, inactivity is going to hurt you. But same goes for boxing, same goes for sports. So he's planning to box in December. That's one year after his last fight. That's a long layoff for a fighter. Yeah. So he will fight this year. Doesn't matter whether it's here, doesn't matter if it's O2, doesn't matter if it's at some other quirky little venue that we've come up with. I'm working on the basis of the worst case scenarios yeah. right in my planning and the worst case scenario is we ain't going to have crowds this year mm. I don't think that's the case I think we'll have crowds coming back in from October to be honest with you but everything's subject to the second wave the whatever you know like we might have a vaccine mm. in a month's time two months time who knows we might have a second wave in two months time and we might all be locked down till February yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean I hope not because I tell you I can't do I, another but, I, mean, I, mean, I can't do another one. No, no. But the <laughs> thing is, it's not just, you know, I think that we're kind of lucky that we got things like this yeah. that you can always do. Content is king. But um, how are you? I'm how good, are you, mate? man? Yeah, I'm good. I'm um, got loads of different emotions in lockdown. Just, yeah. you know, I've got two kids who I've never really seen that as much as I should do. Mm. They're all of a sudden were on me every day. I was homeschooling. I he was, was homeschooling. Yeah, I was what was that like for you? Oh, mate, <laughs> the worst. Like the worst. You know, I've got one daughter, she's 10. She just she just knows how to push the buttons. You yeah. know what I mean? You talk about the stress of Jarrell Miller failing a drug test. Not in the same league, league. is this? Yeah, I hear that. You know, still. like we're doing the maths. And, you know, I just say, right, just add that up. You know, four plus four. Yeah. 13. And I'm like, don't want me up. Yeah. She's yeah. like, all right, all right. It's difficult. Yeah, it, it is, is difficult. It is, but then it started to become exciting. Yeah. If you can switch the mindset to say, okay, we got, like I said, we got a problem, but now we're going to focus on the challenge of overcoming it. Yeah. That that can drive you, and that did drive me. And you know, yeah. I was in a stage there where, you know, it, it's just the uncertainty. Yeah. Now I feel like we got a little bit more. We still we don't know what's going to happen, but at least we can start planning. Yeah. Trying. No, even with this, we're one week into a four week project. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Don't lock nothing down. Yeah, Do you yeah. know what I mean? You, they could come out tomorrow and go, right, new data in. Yeah. Sorry, guys. And we're like, oh, so how much we spent on this? We don't get a refund. I you know, no, I mean? I hear that. So it's like, just just hold on to your hats. You've got to bank, keep on banking things, you know, yeah. as a business right now. Right, another day. Doesn't matter if you're a restaurant, shop, bar. Oh, we've got another day. Sales, yeah. boom. Next day. We'll go again tomorrow. Next day, next day. Because yeah. the uncertainty across everything at the of moment. Of course. Is, is ma there massive uncer uncertainty. But obviously, man, it's like looking at it, it must be super proud because obviously you, you grew up here in that, yeah? Mm. You said obviously you moved here when you was five. Come here when I was five. And, yeah. um, do, do, uh, let me ask you, yeah? Like, what, at what age or stage was you at, yeah, when you realised that you lived in a house like this? <laughs> I was, it was when we arrived. So, to give the background, do you understand what I mean? Because I feel yeah, the course, reason for sure. No, no, because it's very difficult. Like, I kind of feel like I never had this background and I never yeah. grew up, if that makes sense. Because I don't feel like I work like I did, if that makes sense, mm. have this background. Do you know what I mean? So, what, what I mean by that is, is my dad's from Dagenham, right? Which is like, East London mm. grew up in a council estate there dad was a bus driver etc etc obviously started doing very well for himself I grew up in Epping and we lived in a house that was a tenth of the size of this nice house do you know what mm. I mean he was doing well but and then all of a sudden he started doing really well and he bought this place for 200 grand Jesus right? crispy <laughs> 35 years ago so when we turned up here it was quite funny because I, for the first time, experienced and probably 
you know, sadly, and not my fault, but just how it went, this was the only time that I experienced that, blah, look at what we got. Like, yeah. I can't, you know, because from there, we just kept doing well and well, better yeah, and better yeah, and better. Going, so yeah. it's like, but when I came here, I remember rolling down these hills there just by the steps, like for hours, going, Dad, like, and running, you know, there's a forest down there, and like, Dad, let's go, Dad, like, yeah. you know, and it, him as well, because he, of course, come from that estate where he was like, you know, and there's a pond down there, he'd go, we'd yeah. all take our rods down there and stuff like that, and yeah. he, you know, and then that, that was like, because I came here so early, I never really, life was always like that for me, so, I appreciated it, yeah. But it was just how it always was, yeah. So you know, he was at the time managing snooker players, boxers, and he would have two limousines. One was a white one, one was a stretch black one. Mm -hmm. At the time where they didn't really even exist here, like you mm -hmm. didn't have them at weddings and stuff like that. And I would get picked up in school mm -hmm. in the limo, and I'd get my mates in, and we'd have the music blaring, and I was like ten or eleven. I mean, horrible. I was a proper horrible kid, like you know. But it's like the lifestyle. Yeah, I'm mates with Eubank. Yeah, I'm mates yeah. with Nigel Ben. Yeah, and what you know, like I was horrible. But listen, but like, obviously, I know. Yeah, you're like you're a married man. You got a family mm. and whatnot. Yeah, but in your younger days, <laughs> pulling up here with a girl must have been an absolute stunt. Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, serious. I think when I was like, do you know what? Most of that happened, sort of. Um, I started early in that respect, you know, like from the ages of probably 16, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, like that, that was really, there's a swimming pool in there and yeah. like, you know, but obviously I lived there with my mum and dad as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but you can, and my mum, my mum. You could be here for a couple of weeks. But my mum was like super, my mum's super straight, like okay. super, my old man. So like, you know, if I was caught in a young lady and brought her back, yeah. you know, my mum would go, she's not allowed in. My dad would go, just keep it quiet, son, down there. You know what I mean? I won't tell your mum. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I probably, you know, I was out of action in the, in sort of from my mid twenties. So yeah, like Honorable probably, probably missed, the, missed the boat on that. But I I had, that. you know, we had some good times. I used to get all the mates here and like, we'd yeah. have like I said, parties here and stuff like that. But this is, um, this is, provides me with as good a feeling as that because, you know, it's, uh, the stage and, and it's people say is it weird when we moved it from a house into a head office mm -hmm. people were like is it weird you know mm. and it was never weird for me like oh you know the accounts department's in your old bedroom mm. but never really felt like that to me yeah but the feeling of being here makes me feel so good you know yeah. like when you've when there's a place it's like a happy place I guess you know I spent the best years of my life here so to work here feels great yeah to stage events here feels great i mean on saturday night you know normally we're only allowed uh, two media in all right with the british boxing board of control normally i finish a show at the o2 the guys fighters and everyone do their drug tests i do 60 interviews with mm -hmm. all the media then we do press conferences i don't get out there till four o'clock in the morning yeah i finished here at half 11 i was home by quarter to 12 do you know oh, what i mean man, in yeah. bed i mean i couldn't sleep yeah. but you know it's, it's a it's a nice it's a nice feeling yeah, you know and, and it's uh, sick, man it's sick. You know, we we hope that the next three weeks go as well as they do. And of course, I can't believe when you look at it and think Dillian White will fight Povetkin in there and Taylor crazy. will fight Bassoon. You know, you got you got night. a book as well coming, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called uh, Relentless. Okay. Um, and I said, but I think I'm a bit young to do an autobiography. And they said, no, it's not really an autobiography. It's about business, it's about mindset, it's about drive, it's about passion, etc. And I was quite into that. I thought I like, you know, I like that. I don't see myself as a genius or an expert, but I think. I've got enough grounding and had enough experience to help people think better and more effectively to be successful. Mm -hmm. So it covers off, you know, everything from positivity to sales to mm -hmm. negotiating to, you know, my story coming through to, you know, bouncing back to uh, relationships with people to, you know, motivating a team. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like there's a lot of stuff about how I got to where I got to but there's also a lot of stuff about what I think it takes to run a successful business and to be individually mm. successful, whether that be through business or through life. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think it's adapted a bit. The book comes out in October, but lockdown has has made me spin the book a little bit more, a little bit of like a bit of happiness in there. Yeah. You know, it's not just you need to sell this and you have to do this. It's more, you know, it sort of lends itself to, but you have to feel comfortable within yourself. For real. You know, you have to be able to look in the mirror and smile and be wake up. And and, and um, at Middleton, 
who I've spoke to a number of times in lockdown across different projects, he said something that really resonated with me, which is positivity and happiness are two very different things. Very, so very you can so. drive yourself, you know, you can be positive, you can be that guy, and someone can look at you and go, I love that guy, you know, he's got so much drive. But deep down, when you peel it all back, he's hurt. You, yeah, you're not really, yeah, you're sad. not happy. So sad, don't, yeah. you know, just because someone's bubbly and yeah. you know, drive, you know, get up every day while we go at it. They may get home at night and just think, oh, I don't, I don't know where I'm going. I'm yeah. not happy. You could be covering. Feel, you could be. Shit. You could be drowning your sadness in positivity. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think that what lockdown has shown you yeah. is you can sometimes get too caught up in the hustle. Yeah. Where it's like everybody, you know, people talk about, yeah, respect the hustle. Yeah, dude. And I'm a big. That's a big mantra of mine, right? I really love people to get out and graft their nuts off every day. But sometimes, and this definitely happened to me in the last year, you can kind of forget about one, what's important in life, two, your family probably a little bit as well because you become obsessed with this hustle and you become obsessed with winning in business and you don't want to take your foot off the gas because you know if you do, someone could go past you. Yeah. But you can't let that affect the important things because when, you, when your time is done, and you're ready to leave this place called Earth. Yeah. You have to be able to lay there and go, did I do it right? Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. did I get the max out of my life? One of the chapters in the book is called Play the Hand You're Dealt. And it's all about being comfortable with where you are and the path that you've been really given. I got a great hand. I got a set I got a pair of aces. Do you know what I mean? So I got the opportunity to play that hand well as the flop rolled out. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. If you play poker, you'll understand yeah, what I mean. Yeah. So so for me, it was always about when I was at school, I was no say no one knew me as Eddie, but I was Barry Earn's son. Right? He was really well known at the time. You know, he had the cars, he was on TV all the time. And it was literally that's Barry Earn's son. That's Barry Hearn's son. And at the time I didn't care because I was going, Yeah, I'm Barry Earn. I was telling people I'm Barry Earn's son. Do you know what I mean? Try and get him back here or getting a team or whatever, you know. So, but after a while, I started to realize that actually you've got to be your own person. You've got, and if you don't take this whole thing, and I was always going to, I didn't work here for four or five years when I went into the workplace because I wanted to try and achieve something myself, but I was always going to end up here. But when I ended up here, if I didn't do anything outrageous, if I didn't do anything special, I would be Barry Hearn's son. For the, the rest, rest of, of my life, life. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. And listen, he's a legend, so it ain't the end of the world. But I want to make my own path, you know. I, and now I feel like I've done that, and I'm comfortable to say that I've done that, you yeah. know. But where does it stop? You know, for me, now we talk about a global expansion. You know, we're opening offices. We've, we have offices in New York. We have offices in Spain. We want to open offices in Sydney, Toronto, in Berlin, and that's really where I can take the business to a global level that when he started up and had a little couple of rooms in a snooker hall in Romford as the matchroom office, he can look at now and go, like, he's 72, you know? Honourable shout out to uh, to Barry. How long has he got left? You know, we don't know. But one thing I know is, is he will take a little step back from next June Mm. and he will start just sort of trying to enjoy his life a little bit more. The truth is, Chucky, if you gave me the choice and you gave him the choice and you said, I'll tell you what, Barry, Retire now. What do you love? Well, I love fishing. I love going away. I love, right, we're going to take you fishing three times a week at the best lakes. We're going to take you golf twice a day on the best golf courses in Europe, but you've got to pack it in. He goes, no way. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's the difference where we do it because we love it. Mm. And at the moment, I don't feel that. I feel like I would be sad without this in my life. So why stop? 100%. 100%. Do you know what, yeah? When that book comes out, I'm going to read it and I'm going to take some parts out of it and we're going to have a good, good. chin wag good. again yeah, I think on a part three. I because think it's, like, it's just going to be one of those books where I think it's going to help you strategically. Yeah. But I think it, you might just read it and go, yeah, you know what? I think it makes sense. And yeah. I just hope that people enjoy it and, you know, and it can help because I don't feel like there's any secret really. Yeah. I've worked harder in lockdown probably than I have Having done in, your life. in the previous year. Yeah, it's crazy. And now we've come out the other side, hopefully in good spot. Thank you for um, 
you Thanks know, for allowing us down, to come mate. to your your headquarters and and do this. Um, yeah, man, I really appreciate it, and and like I, I'm a massive fan of what you do, man. Seriously, appreciate very, it. Very appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming down. And yeah, we'll do it again, man. Shout no out doubt. to JD as always for the support. Yeah, thanks to JD Under Armour, JD and the Duffel Bag Podcast, Eddie Hearn, Chucky Online. 